Hi, this is Little Dwarf playing games while rambling incoherently into a microphone. Why? Well, just because I can. And this time I'll be playing The Dwarfs Blind. Now, I know nothing about this game except for the fact that it's based on a book by the same name by a German author, uh, Marcus Heinz, I believe. But I have not read that book and in fact, I'm not sure if it's available in English. So I'll have to look it up later, because I picked up this game just because of the subject matter. Because if you haven't guessed by my channel name and my channel icon, and by all the other things uh, I've talked about while playing various fantasy games, dwarves are by far my favorite fantasy race. Uh, and it's very rare for them to play a main role in a fantasy story, because usually they are relegated to, to the sidelines. There's usually like one token dwarf in the whole party. And for me, I really love dwarves. I love their uh, moral philosophy and their outlook on life and how dedicated they are to, to, to upholding their values and how, how they prefer dying to dishonor and how they uh, sort of strive with this, uh, you know, with, with this utmost fervor to do what they think is right. And if they fail, they often feel so much shame that they basically punish themselves. Uh, th their whole society is built, uh, you know, on this idea that doing what is right is paramount. And you have to, you know, you have to do your best to uphold the honor of yourself and of your clan and of your, you know, of your kingdom and whatever. And it really speaks to me. Uh, I really like how dedicated and how, how driven dwarves usually are in fantasy stories. I don't know the exact take on the dwarves in this game because, as, as I said, it's going to be a blind playthrough and I have not read the book. But uh, even then, I'm just eager to see them playing a main role. So, I am going to play on hard difficulty, which might be a mistake, because, to be honest, I'm not really good at games. Like, to be honest, I kind of suck, if you really think about it. Uh, but I do enjoy the challenge nonetheless. Let me start then, let's go. Fracas made us from stone to protect Gardelgard. Against orcs, ogres, and all the other beasts of Tion. We are the guardians of Girdlegard. We are the children of the Divine Smith. We are the dwarves. Okay, so that was a, you know, an opening trying to pump you up. Although it was a little bit uh, undercut by this sudden loading screen. Uh... Okay, pause the game anytime by pressing space, move the camera by using the middle mouse button and the mouse wheel. On the way! Uh, click on leap attack uh, or press E and then select your target on the battlefield. So I have to kill 60 orcs. It seems the game is at least going to play straight uh, with the idea that the orcs and the dwarves are natural enemies. Mm, I probably should be careful not to wound my own my own allies. That, 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 that didn't really do much, but I have some other abilities like a mm, mighty blow, mighty blow that causes a lot a lot of damage uh, to a few enemies and knocks them back. Okay. So I think the, the orcs killed by my allies also count because uh, it increases a lot faster than it, than it would uh, if it just counted my own kills. Mm, so that's, that's reassuring because killing 60 orcs on my own uh, could have been kind of difficult. 
Although I'm getting my ass uh, handed to me, so I have to be a little bit more careful and maybe actually utilize... Hmm, did I kill one of my own? That's pretty heinous. I'm not sure. I wasn't paying that much attention, to be honest. Uh, but maybe I, I really have to kind of... A present from the workshop! Mm, go over to the crate. Uh, with the grenades you can be creative, okay. Uh, I, I think I might have to utilize my, my allies as a bit of a meat shield, because uh, I'm getting really low on health myself. Ha! I'd be happy to pass on this present to the greenskins. Understood! Okay, let's try them out. That's that. Okay, that's pretty impressive, I guess. Although, it's mostly knockback. Like, it doesn't do that much damage, uh, when you really think about it. It's mostly knockback. Mm. So I'm not sure what to think about it, to be honest. But I, I really probably should utilize it more, although, on the other hand, uh, I'm having this habit of hoarding supplies, uh, always thinking in the future that there might be a situation uh, where I need them more. And it usually never comes, so, uh, you know, so, so maybe I shouldn't be hoarding them that much. But we're getting there. Gizelbert I and I, the father of the Fifthling clan, has not been on the front line of battle against the creatures of Teon for many cycles. The king surveys the battlefield and the defenders with a grave expression. <sighs> we are too few. This you know as well as he does, but there will be no reinforcements arriving. Hundreds of brave warriors lie inside the fortress dying. The illness is running rampant. It brings weakness and death. Stay at your posts. Be as steadfast as the granite of which we are made. Nothing can break us. Vrakas is with us. Okay, change between the characters by pressing tab. Select more than one at a time by pressing shift and left click. Okay, so I have the king available now uh, and there are also some enemy ogres uh, um, for Vrakas, Gisselbard motivates himself and the nearby heroes for a short time ok that's probably something that's worth using for a buff oh I think uh, while the game is paused you can give commands to the heroes ok that's kind of understandable uh, I think this ability yes. also heals me, so so it's worth remembering uh, if I get really low on health, because I did before. Okay, I have to kill the two ogres and then yes. destroy two catapults. You can even see them shooting. Okay, let's go. Let's push forward. Mm, they should, the, the, the regular soldiers should be able to handle those stragglers over there, and I will push over to the catapults. Okay, that might have not been the... the best move. Come 
here and die. <laughs> Apparently, These destroying the, the catapults. We suffered great losses beating them back. Come here and I'll split you like a straw, you treacherous elf! In his fury, the old king radiates a ferocious power that none of Citalia's children could withstand. But the slight, willowy being sitting astride the shadow mare just grins down, mockingly. You are mistaken. We are Alpha. We are here to destroy the elves. All peace-loving beings here in Girdlegard are under our protection, and you cannot open the gate that has barred your path into Girdlegard since the creation of the world. Not us, but perhaps one of your kind. This cannot be. Silence, you fool! Vrakas, forgive me for what I am about to do! Quickly! In formation! You must hold them back until I close the gate! <laughs> Yes! Okay, first, it was kinda stupid to throw your axe at him. I'm not sure why he still has an axe. He could have, it wasn't that far. He could have just gone, uh, uh, you know, up, up to him and st st struck him down in melee. Uh, but also, I thought for a second that, uh, that uh, the, the antagonists of this game are going to be the elves, which. I'm not going to lie, would be kind of awesome in a way, because, you know, the, the dwarves versus elves rivalry is uh, is also very common uh, in fantasy, but it usually uh, doesn't, you know, doesn't get to, to blows, like, it doesn't get uh, um, into, the, into the scale of a full-blown war, although it did, I guess, uh, most famously in Warhammer, but also uh, in Middle Earth, like there have been actual armed conflicts Understood. between elves and the dwarves in uh, in the All mythology right. of the Lord of the Rings. Uh, so, Look at me. I am Syntharas, the reaper of your death. I will take your life, and the land will take your soul. Get out of my sight, pointy ears, and let me delight at the closed gate a little longer. The gate may have closed, but when you rise again from the dead by the power of the land, you will be one of us, and you will open it. Never! My soul belongs to Rakas. No, your soul now belongs to the land, and henceforth you will belong to it forever. Now die, and return. Then hand us Girdlegard. No! You're a perfectionist, Tungdil Bolifar. I've got a reputation to uphold. If you can't rely on the metalwork of a dwarf, what can you rely on? Hmm. What can I do for you? I guess. Let's be nice. What can I do for you? For me, nothing. It's Lot Yonan. He wants to see you in his study. In your mind, you go through all the recent incidents that might have annoyed the Magus. Apart from a few little squabbles with his famuli, nothing worth mentioning happened since the incident with your beard. You nod. Okay. Oh, wait. Did did, did my beard get like burnt or something? Is that why it's it, why it's so short? That's a pretty traumatic experience for a dwarf. Uh, 
I have more to say on the intro, but I will wait until this dialogue is over, as to not mess up the, the pace too much. Uh, you look dreadful. Bad night? That's that's a bit... The, the, the you look dreadful part is a bit blunt, but I do believe uh, the a bad night part uh, makes it generally, you know, it is a courtesy, it's just kind of blunt, which I guess, in a way, it's also very dwarven, because dwarves often in fantasy, you know, they are depicted as people that uh, don't have pati much patience for, like, flowery speeches and, uh, and uh, you know, generally, uh, what's the word? Hmm... You know, they don't they don't like mincing words. They they, they like being direct and uh, sort of blunt, uh, as it were. So it might be something that Worf would say. And as I said, I do believe it is generally a sign of concern. It's just worded in a way that uh, you know regular people uh, might have misconstrued as kind of rude. So I guess I'm going to see see uh, what does she think about it. You look dreadful. What a charmer. The maid gives you an ironic, reprimanding scowl. Ikana has been crying half the night. When you were teething, I carried you around the vaults. You played with my beard and I sang you to sleep. Frala smiles. She's heard this story many times before. That was 23 cycles ago. But I'm quite sure you didn't sing. You might have grumbled a bit. If what you've read about the dwarven lifespan is true, It'll be another 300 sun cycles and more before you are called to the Eternal Forge. The certainty of one day having to witness Frala's death already burdens your heart. I'd better not keep the Magus waiting. See you later. There's goulash for dinner. Okay, so a couple of things uh, about the intro part. Uh, because, as I said, at first I thought... Uh, this is going to be about uh, about the conflict between the dwarves and the elves. But then uh, the, the antagonist, Sintoras, I believe was his name, he said they are Alfer or something, and they are they are here to destroy the elves. So from, from that I presume they are some kind of a dark cousin. They are like the dark elves of this universe. But I, I fail to see, like, why did he reveal that? That's kind of stupid, because uh, from what the Dwarven King said, it seemed that at the time uh, he didn't know the distinction. He, he called Sintoras an elf, so if I were him, I would uh, play into that. Like, I would uh, basically uh, pretend that I am an elf to sow, you know, confusion and anger and distrust between the dwarves and the actual elves, who presumably might not be evil in this universe, uh, unlike the Ulfer. Uh, so that's kind of stupid of them, I guess. But but maybe maybe it's it's just because uh, he was very megalomaniacal and he assumed that he doesn't need any actual you know rules or anything to win because he thought he's already superior. That's pretty common with, with villains, you know, when they don't actually use all of the advantages on their disposal because they assume that they are going to win anyway, which I guess, as stupid as it is from a detached perspective, uh, is not really that unrealistic, because that does happen a lot. Like, there are a lot of people who are overconfident to the point where it's an actual detriment to their chances of success. So I'm not I'm not particularly angry at that development. I'm just weirded out. Uh, and also, also, uh, what did I want to? I wanted to to say something else. Well, apparently, a thousand years uh, have have passed since the intro and now. So, so I guess maybe that depicted. You know, that scene in the intro depicted the first sort of invasion of the evil forces 
into this world because it seemed uh, also from the intro well it was stated directly that the dwarves are like the guardians of this world and they had this huge gate uh, you know presumably at the edge of the civilized lands to protect them but the gates have been breached uh, and also, uh, coming back to that, because I just rem remembered what I wanted to talk about, it's kind of stupid, I think, how, judging from what Sintora said, he is going to kill uh, the, the Dwarven commander of the guard, and then raise him, presumably as an undead of sorts, and then still that, that undead Dwarf would be able to open the gate. Like, that's kind of stupid of the Dwarves to design it this way. Uh, because why wouldn't they do it in a way in which only a living dwarf can open it? Like, it seems like a really bad idea to, to leave that loophole. But then again, I might be too hard on them, because uh, maybe, I guess it's going to be sorted out, uh, you know, as the story develops, I'm going to learn more about it. But maybe before that encounter, the dwarves didn't even realize that being raised as an undead is a possibility. So th then they wouldn't th think about it because uh, to them it wasn't something you have to think about. I guess we're going to see. Uh, so let's uh, look around this forge. There was a time when you could hardly lift the heavy hammer. Now you barely notice it anymore, and it feels like an extension of your arm. Smithing is in your blood. This is where you swung the forge hammer for the first time, 30 cycles ago. No one taught you the craft. It was enough for you to watch Lot Yonan's old smith at work. Whenever the workshop was empty, you practiced and quickly mastered the craft with ease. Well, I am a dwarf, so there is that. There are apparently dwarves who have never seen the sky. And you too feel more comfortable when you have rock over your head. If only you didn't long to see more of the world, a longing that grows stronger with every year. Mm, leather cloth. Okay, let's look at that. Ah, it's my axe. Let's take it. <sighs> Presumably it's going to be useful, you know, in my adventures that surely await me in the future. Mm, Altar to Vrakas. Everything you know about dwarves you learnt from books. The Divine Smith created the Dwarves, and from time to time you make him an offering of some crumbs of gold. It's the most valuable thing you have to offer Vrakas. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so I guess I'm some kind of an orphan, I, uh, because it, it, it talked about how everything I know about the Dwarves uh, I've learned from books. So I've been raised by humans, I take it. Or maybe maybe it's elves, but because I don't know, they, they said something about a mage. Uh, I, I guess it would be a very interesting development uh, to have a dwarf raised by elves. Uh, I, I don't think, uh, I don't know of any such character uh, in fiction, because obviously uh, uh, a dwarf, uh, well, I guess I don't know any dwarves raised by humans either, because I know a human raised by dwarves, which would be a carrot, carrot Iron Founder's son uh, of, of the Discworld mm, universe uh, by Terry Pratchett. Uh, but uh, th this description of the altar made me wonder, like, uh, actually, how does it work with the offerings? If I offer uh, Vrakas gold, uh, does he, like, literally take it? Does he exist and, and somehow consume it? Because if not, then, you know, if there are no priests to spend it on, you know, uh, running the temple or something, what happens with the offering? Like, it's not, it's not like gold spoils or something. So if nobody takes it, then it's just going to lie there in front of the altar forever? 
and I'm going to just add more and more, uh, uh, you know, up, uh, upon that. I don't think the developers of the game intended me to think so hard about it, but I somehow am compelled to do it. So I, I'm not quite sure, but I guess I'm going to maybe learn later if Vrakas is an entity, if gods in this universe take an active role uh, in it, or are they, you know, a big unknown. Mm, look at the horse figurine. You've worked a bit more on Sunya's birthday present last night. The little one is crazy about horses. You, on the other hand, prefer to keep your distance unless you're fitting them with hooves. Too many legs and way too big. Hmm. Okay, so it seems I am a, a rather versatile craftsman because I'm not only a, a very good smith, but I can also uh, work wood uh, as a sculptor. Hey, groundling, come to the kitchen, we need you. Jollison, a fourth degree famulus and your favorite foe among the students of magic, gives you a disparaging glance and disappears without waiting for your reply. Mm. Is groundling like an anti-dwarf slur? Uh, Lotionen study. Okay, I'm not going to enter here yet, because obviously that's where I need to go. He summoned me. So I'm going to explore the rest of the um, of the I don't know fortress tower house. Look at the map. A map of Girdelgard. The kingdoms of the humans are marked, but the map maker's focus was the magic realms of the Magi: Yonandar, Brandokai, Leos Nudin, Oromyra, Saborian, and Tuguria. While most of the landscape features are missing, the veins of the magic fields are marked in painstaking precision. Five veins spread out under Girdelgard, beginning at Leos Nudin in the middle. Okay. I presume that might be relevant later on. I should speak to Lord Yonan first. He doesn't like to be kept waiting. You mumble and wonder when you started speaking thoughts like this out loud. Okay. Lot Yonan's vaults are equipped with laboratories, a library, and private rooms for the Famuli. Together with the forge, the kitchen, and the other utility rooms, it makes up quite an impressive complex. But compared to the courts of the other Magi, the seat of power in Yonandar is small and modest. Hmm. So, if his name is Lot Yonan, and he's, uh, you know, his stronghold, his school of magic, his place of being is called Yonandar, then I assume all of the other magical places uh, also take their names from like their leaders or something. Which again, I, I, I don't yet have anything to do with this information, but it might be... Uh, Pearl for some food. Well, that's kind of rude, isn't it? Because the word pilfer implies I'm going to straight up steal it, uh, which is, you know, kind of rude, uh, to, to put it mildly. Tell, quick, or the goulash will get burnt. You immediately recognize what the problem is. A chain running over a pulley for positioning the cauldron is detached from its mounting and the cauldron stuck in the fireplace. It's a heavy load, and none of the famuli, who feel superior even during kitchen duty, dare do anything. They might burn their fingers, or even get a bit dirty. It'll be a waste of goulash, and I'm hungry. Here, hold this. <laughs> With as much concern in your voice as you can muster, you say, Oh, no, no, this doesn't look good. You're pleased to notice he's dripping with sweat. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get you back for this, groundling! 
Okay, I'm not, I'm not going to torture him too much with having to hold it. Let's just repair it and I guess maybe we can talk afterwards. You damned freak! For a moment you hope the Famulus really does raise his hand to you. But then he comes to his senses and leaves the kitchen, his face bright red. What a pair you are! To be honest, I'm not sure why he was so angry. Because I did help him. I was instrumental in helping him. Uh, if not for me, it would have probably, you know, the, the whole dish would have been spoiled and maybe, you know, the, the pot would have broken eventually from the heat or something. Or maybe even a fire would have started. Like, they, they literally needed my help and I did help them. So, uh, you know, he might, I, I realize he might have been a bit irritated for me, uh, at me for not repairing it immediately, but still, I, I think his reaction overall is a bit of an overkill. The goulash is bubbling in the cauldron. You draw the warm air in through your nose and the smell makes your mouth start watering. Okay, can I talk with... Her? Vegetables, bread, cheese, but the cook is not to be trifled with. Many painful knuckles have taught you that she knows how to handle her heavy wooden spoon, and that she may possibly have eyes in the back of her head. Uh, let's talk to Frala. Do you know what Lord Yonan wants? The maid gives you an amused look. She has often accused you of making things more complicated than necessary. <laughs> I guess she's implying, uh, or I guess the na their narrator is implying that if I want to know what he wants, uh, I should go just go and ask him, which I guess is a fair point. I was hoping for a conversation on different matters, maybe? Do you know what Lord Yonan wants? The maid. Okay, I guess she doesn't want to talk. The beer that is delivered to the vaults is supposed to be the best beer in Iddersleyn. It's certainly your favorite beer, but you haven't drunk enough other beers to truly know. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to steal the food uh, out of the place where I've been raised. Like, that's, you know, uh, you know, generally speaking, obviously stealing is, is wrong uh, overall, but, uh, but what I'm trying to say is uh, doing it from a place where I've lived my entire life and presumably I haven't been that mistreated. Like, it didn't, it didn't seem uh, from the overall impression that I've been... Uh, you know, abused or something in here? Is, is it just that the other students of... some of the other students uh, of magic uh, don't really like me? Presumably because I don't do magic myself and I am a dwarf, which makes them we uh, weirded out or something. And so I will just try to find my food on the corpses of the enemies that tried to kill me, because usually that's, wh that's where I draw the line on property rights in games. Like, I try to generally be decent and uh, don't steal from people if I can avoid that, but uh, in games I would say once you try to kill me you have forfeited your property rights. Like I, I feel I am within my rights to kill you back and then take your stuff to help me with advancing the game. Mm, so with that being said I need to pause for a second, be right back. Okay I'm back. So let's finally go to Lot Yonan and see what he wants. Master Lot Yonan, Frala told me you wished to speak with me. Ah, Tangdil, come in. Uh, there is a bag over there in the cupboard. Take it out, please. It contains artifacts belonging to my former Famulus Goren. I wish to return them to him. He's in Black Saddle, 300 miles away. 300 miles? That's a long journey. Who are you going to entrust with this? I was thinking of you. Me? 
There is no one better to take on this journey. You have acquired much knowledge. You are almost a scholar. You know more than most family about Girdlegard and its inhabitants. It is time for you to go out into the world and see it with your own eyes. I... with pleasure. Perhaps I'll meet some dwarves on my travels. Yes, perhaps. But don't hold out too much hope. And be careful who you talk to. Not everyone out there likes dwarves. Yeah, goblins. They abduct baby dwarves and sell them to magi, from what I've heard. Not the best bit of business I've ever done. But what was I to do? The long noses threatened to throw you into the nearest river. No. Oh, at first I was kind of confused. Because I thought he was talking, like, in general, I thought he was talking about how it's commonplace for goblins to sell dwarven children to mages. And I was like, that's pretty weird. And also kind of uncomfortable to mention to a mage. But I guess he was uh, joking about how he himself came to be here. Mm. What's in the bag? Magical devices. Uh, you better leave the bag closed if you want to avoid any accidents. Dwarves don't really like magic, and magic doesn't like you either. Rackus gave us so much craftsmanship that there's no space left in our bodies for magic. Strictly speaking, every time you've been too close to magic, it has ended in catastrophe. Mm -hmm. Be on your guard. Look after the bag and don't lose it. May Palandiel be with you. And Varakas too, of course. I'll set off immediately. I'll see you soon, Lot Yonan. Okay. Uh, maybe I can talk with the others before I leave. Like, maybe Frella will have to s something to say now. Of the 200 or so people selected to learn the art of magic under Lot Yonan, there's barely a handful of them you can stand the sight of. You're not at all interested in magic in all its elusiveness and whimsy. Your realm is the Forge. Okay, I still prefer to buy my food or take it from my fallen enemies. I'm not going to steal from this place. Oh, there's a cradle. I, I have a gift, I think. I have a wooden horse. I, I would imagine it's for the child. I am your godfather, little one. I'll look after you just like I looked after your mother. Little Akana grasps your calloused finger and smiles at you wide-eyed. Hmm. Although I guess not, because uh, the name mentioned uh, when I looked at the horse was different. Hello, Frala. Hmm? Oh, apparently I have a present for her. But but the horse is not for her either. She's a grown woman at this point. Uh, but, but, but I do have a present apparently, so let's give it to her. I've got a present for you. You take out a symbol of protection that you've carefully made from three horseshoe nails. It's not the finest jewelry in Girdlegard. One look at Frala's face makes it clear that it doesn't matter. She glows with happiness as she takes the pendant. For me? But why? Because you don't see me as an oddity and you're like a little sister to me. You could have said. But you settle with a shrug and a crooked smile. Mm, apparently I also need provisions. Which I guess is understandable. 300 miles is quite a trek. <laughs> I need provisions for 300 miles. You're grinning from ear to ear. Finally, you've got the chance to see something of the world. 300? Tungdal, that's no errand. That's an epic journey. Wait, I've got just the right thing. But make sure the cook doesn't see. I'm going to Black Saddle to return a few things to a former apprentice in Amagus. You pocket the rye bread, sausages and ham. Enough food for the first few days of your journey. Perhaps I'll even meet some dwarves on the way. Frala throws you a cautious glance. It's a tricky subject that you can't help but broach. They're 
aren't dwarves down here. You're the only one in Idda's Lane, as far as we know. I know, but I can't just have been born out of a rock. Somewhere in the mountains, I have a clan. Maybe even a family. Yes. Maybe. Frala has reminded you more than once that Lot Yonan wrote to the dwarf clans, and none of them were missing a dwarf boy. I have to go. I've got a long journey ahead of me. I wish you the blessing of Palandiel and Vrakas to protect you from all danger on your journey. Here, a talisman. Whenever you look at it, think of me. Frala winks at you mischievously. And of getting me a nice present. Mm -hmm. Okay, what did I get? I have gold. Uh, Frala's scarf brings good fortune to the wearer. Okay. Magical artifacts, some items that you're supposed to bring to Gorin, a former familus of Lotionen, and provisions automatically heals injuries during journeys. Okay. Mm, I have a passive skill, Stubborn. If his health is under 30%, Tungdil gains bonuses on, of our armor and damage, and I have Blacksmith's Blow. Okay. Let's continue. Mm. So I guess I'm more or less ready to leave, because I don't know what to do with the wooden horse. I thought I might be able to give it to the child, but... If I hurry, I might be back in time for Sonia's birthday. You're longing to see her face when you give her your homemade present. Hmm, so that's, that's someone else. I wonder if I can pray before going out, because this dialogue has actually changed. I wonder if dwarves ask Vrakus for help on long journeys. The figure on the homemade altar doesn't answer. Hmm. Okay, so it does change. Interesting. I will check the forge as well. Oh, I cannot click on it. Well, I guess it's time to leave then. Within a few moments, you find Black Saddle on the map. It is southeast of Parista, a little more than halfway between the city of the Magus Nudin and Lot Yonan's vaults. You trace the path from the vaults to the mountain with your finger. It doesn't seem far on the map, but it will be the biggest journey of your life. Okay, let's go. How nice to see you again, Lot Yonan. It must have been an age since we last met face to face. Nudin, welcome. Please, sit down. No, thank you, my friend. These are urgent matters, and I don't have much time. You must come to Leos Nudin immediately. The perished land is stirring. Are you sure? What makes you think that? I found out about 60 orbits ago, during a visit to the borders. Our magical barriers have weakened and become porous. The Elfa have left their land, and a huge horde of orcs have marched into Girdelgard. Were you able to strengthen the spell with your magic? No. I can't repair the damage alone. We need the combined power of the six. The other four are already on their way here, but we need your help too. I will set off for Parista without delay. Oh, and um, as you're coming, could you also take the opportunity to bring back the things that I lent to you? Of course. I have them already packed in a bag. Oh, thank you. We'll be expecting you. Utterly blinded by the sunlight, you squeeze your eyes tightly shut after only a few steps. 
The time spent underground has made you so sensitive to light that you're forced to seek shelter in the shade of a mighty oak. Okay. Uh, I have to say something. I realize that that is mightily uh, presumptuous of me and also uh, kind of prejudiced. Like, I do realize that, but I have to say, I have like a 98% certainty that that Nudin guy is a villain. Because as much as it might sound prejudiced for me to say it, I only say it because uh, because it's such a prevalent theme overall in fiction for uh, deformed or uh, mm, you know ugly characters to also be evil that I have I am almost certain that the developers of the game have also fallen into this exact line of thinking although I guess if they didn't then I'm going to feel a little bit ashamed of myself and of assuming that because you know it is a very stupid stereotype uh, and, and something that's also, as I said, kind of hurtful potentially uh, to equate uh, physical attractiveness and, you know, being able-bodied with being good and the opposite as being evil. Because obviously deformed people aren't evil. The people are just people. And th th this trope of, uh, like, people with disabilities or people that, that are not conventionally attractive being bad is stupid and I don't like it at all, but I do realize it is a trope and that's why I thought about it. Um, but I guess let's uh, continue and maybe the game will shame me uh, later on. Okay, so I'm going right here, uh, Black Saddle. And apparently I have a couple of ways to get there. I think I'm going to go through the cities, because, for example, there is a question mark here, so presumably something interesting is going to happen. I think I'm going to go right here and then to here to, to visit the most of the locations on the map. You reach a small lake by a birchwood. Your feet hurt and your eyes still sting in the unaccustomed sunlight. But a smile spreads across your face nonetheless. You've covered a decent distance on the first day of your big journey. You pitch your camp and lie down to sleep on the hard forest floor. When you awake in the morning, your legs are stiff and achy. Trying not to feel sorry for yourself, you throw your rucksack over your shoulder. You're a dwarf, and dwarves don't complain. <laughs> Actually, the dwarves in Warhammer they love complaining. Complaining is like a sport to them. Uh, and the older they are, the more they complain about how everything was better when they were younger and how the youngsters nowadays are, you know, rascals and they don't know the proper respect for the long beards and how black powder is a, you know, a new invention that's pointless because crossbows already exist. Like, why would you need a musket? Uh, but maybe it's different in this game. Maybe they are not as grumbly in this universe. Around midday, with the sun high in the sky and the first beads of sweat appearing on your forehead, you see something move next to the road, a few hundred meters ahead. Some crows are pecking at something in the long grass. Hmm... Okay, I'm going to observe for a little bit, because if it's hostiles, then it wouldn't be best to just stroll into their, you know, into their view uh, without a care in the world. You survey the grass, the bushes and the few trees that are growing on both sides of the track. The wind blows through the grass and the leaves tremble. The pecking of the birds is only interrupted by the occasional fluttering of their wings. Apart from that, you see nothing. Hmm. Hmm. 
Am I going to try and sneak up on them? I'm a dwarf, so I presume I'm not the best at sneaking. I guess let's just walk further along the road and see what it is. It, it does, maybe it's not the wisest idea, but as I said, I don't think, I wouldn't presume I'm the best, you know, um, I'm, I'm the best at stealth. When you see the blood on the ground, you try to convince yourself it's from an animal that just happened to be killed on the road by a hunter. You know this is improbable, and your hope disappears completely when you see two human bodies lying in the flattened grass. Mm. Okay, and th those are the bodies. You don't see any signs of a struggle in the area where the corpses are lying. Were they stabbed by a companion? A stranger could hardly have crept up on them with such sparse cover. You look down on a tall, broadly built man. He's wearing dark brown leather armor that is strengthened with iron plates. There's a sword lying next to him. Was he trying to defend himself against something or someone? There is no blood on the sword. A slender man lies in front of you, dressed in an expensive robe. It is in the colors of Turgur the Fair-Faced, one of the six Magi. The dead man must be one of Turgur's famuli. You don't see any wounds. Hmm, no wounds? So were they killed by magic? By Vrakus. There are some narrow stab wounds in the man's chest. The cuts are too big to have been made by arrows, but too small for sword wounds. Hmm, so they were knifed then, presumably. The man has the same incisions. It's clear that both men were killed by the same weapon. But what that weapon might be, you cannot say. A rucksack that probably belonged to one of the dead. It seems to have been searched and then thrown away carelessly. Mm. Okay, I'm going to look through it because uh, the contents might help me determine who they were or something. You find a few implements, some provisions, and a map. A route is drawn on it from Perista, Nudin's capital, to Lot Yonan's vaults. Does this mean that Turga the Fair-Faced is in Perista and wanted to send Lot Yonan a message? And if so, why didn't he use magic? Did he want to contact him without anyone noticing? Why all this secrecy? Okay, are there, any, are there any more bodies or anything else? <laughs> Interestingly enough, for all the attention, the narration, uh, you know, drawn to, to, to that point, I don't see any crows. Hmm, nothing. <laughs> okay. Hmm. It isn't easy to spot uh, the, the 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 objects that I can interact with. You scour the area once more and ask yourself what to do next. Hmm. Well, I, I will look for more clues, because maybe it is an, an option that will make him do it by himself, rather than just staying in the location. I guess I, I'm going to see. Mm, nope. Mm, so I guess... Hmm. I, I guess I'm done, because I don't know what else I can do. If, at first glance, there is no other objects I can interact with, so I'm going to just bury them. And be on my way. You scour the area once more and ask yourself what to do next. Mm, yeah, bury the dead and then continue on your journey. It's time consuming and strenuous work digging shallow graves in the ground with a stick. 
and covering the corpses with a few stones. But it should at least keep the crows from their feasting for a while. You continue on your way so as to put a few more miles between you and your grisly find before night falls. Okay, I cannot dilly dally too much because I'm actually limited by my supplies. I consume a unit of food each day, and uh, from what it seems, each uh, you know each point on the map takes one day to travel to. So I cannot go all, all over the map because I will run out of food. Um, go to the farmstead. Okay. As the gable end of a small farmhouse and a barn appear from behind a hilltop, you hear the loud cries of children at play. A girl runs along the path laughing, followed by a small boy with a big stick in his hand. The boy is trying to catch up his sister with a determined look on his face, but is finding it difficult to keep his short legs under control on the uneven path. Mm. I guess I will try talking to them. Um, some of the mages, I guess Lotionan himself, said that people around here don't really like dwarves, but maybe the children uh, aren't as prejudiced because they didn't have, you know, they, they don't have that much knowledge about what a dwarf even is. So I wonder, uh, you know, what their reaction is going to be. Uh, so walk towards the children and greet them amicably. You walk towards the children. As you raise your hand to greet them, the boy catches sight of you. His eyes grow wide and he points to you with a chubby little finger. All he can manage to say is, there. Now the girl has turned to face you too. Before you can say a word, she lifts her little brother up into her arms and runs screaming towards the farmhouse. Well, they, they clearly don't like dwarves, although presumably, presumably that, that might be just them being scared of me being an adult. Like, it is potentially scary for children to be just randomly greeted by a random adult on the road. Mm, but, but now I kind of feel bad about it, uh, and I, I'm sort of de debating in my head whether it's worse to follow them, because obviously that's... Uh, kind of suspicious, but I would like to explain myself or something like to their parents Sure, I will follow them even though even though uh, Although eh, it, it is immensely creepy like if a child runs away from you I feel like th that's a pretty direct clue that you should leave them alone You know un unless it's like your child then I guess it, it, it changes the equation a little bit. You cannot just give up on your child, on your own child, because uh, it has temporarily run away from you. But if it's somebody else's child, I feel like you should just leave them alone, perhaps. Like, uh, it, as I said, it's kind of creepy and also weird to sort of impose your, yourself on random children that you don't know. So I guess... I guess I will give the, the farm a wide berth and continue on my journey. You don't wish to scare the children further, so you continue on your journey. Yeah, that was kind of bad, <laughs> but, uh, but oh well. Um, I think this episode has been long enough for a first one, so I'm going to save uh, and end it here. That's all for this one, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.